This is the previously mentioned time travel graph. Take a look at that thing. Kind of almost blurry, isn't it? Anytime you have something like this that looks somewhat complicated, the way to do it is just to keep in mind that Rome was not built in a day. Take each part, digest that part, understand the way that works, and then eventually when you get all of the parts together and you understand them individually, you can just put them all together and then you'll see the entire graph. So let me go through it for you. If we look over here on the left hand side, you can see that it says distance in kilometers. This is distance in kilometers from the epicenter to a specific seismic station, a place where there is a seismogram. And if you look at the top left hand side, you can see 1200, which is 1200 kilometers. Then as you go down towards the bottom, 1400, 1600, 1800, 2000, 2200, and then 2400 kilometers away from the epicenter. Notice also this, the horizontal lines on this graph are the representation of distance in kilometers. And each one of these lines, as you go from top to bottom, so in other words, from 1200 to 2400, represents a distance of 20 kilometers. Therefore, if you were along the top at 1200 kilometers, and you can see that the line's a little bit fuzzy on the left-hand side of the 1200, but if you go all the way across, you can see that it actually is, is clear there. So if you're coming down, what's going to happen is this. You'd be at the very top at 1,200 kilometers away from the epicenter, then 1,220, then 1,240, then 1,260, then 1,280, then 1,300, then 1,320, and so on. That's the way this works. Okay, good. Next part. Now notice that I just circled in blue and that kind of rust color the P wave and the S wave. That's what these lines are. They represent the arrival of the P wave and the S wave at a particular seismic station. And notice that the P wave is to the left, the S wave is to the right. This is because the P wave is going to arrive earlier than the S wave. Because remember, the P wave is traveling more rapidly than the S wave is. Notice also that from the top of the graph to the bottom of the graph, that the distance between the P wave and the S wave is increasing. So those lines are getting farther apart as you go from the top to the bottom. We'll come back to them in a minute. Now look along the bottom and it says time in minutes. This is the time that has elapsed since the earthquake started at the focus and the epicenter and how long it took for the P wave and the S wave to arrive at a seismic station. Notice 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 minutes on this particular graph. Also notice this. The minutes, or the time that has elapsed, is being represented by the vertical lines. Okay, so those vertical lines are the time in minutes since the earthquake occurred. The horizontal lines are the distance in kilometers from the epicenter to the seismic station. Let's go back and put these P and S wave lines on. Now notice this, if you were at the top of the graph where 1200 kilometers is stretching in a line across the top of the graph, notice that if you found where the P wave intersects the 1200 and you went straight down, you'd see that the P wave arrived a little bit under three minutes at the seismic station since the earthquake originated. And notice that the S wave in that case, if if indeed the seismic station was 1200 kilometers away from the epicenter, the S wave would arrive about five and a half minutes or so after the earthquake started. Then notice down along the bottom where 2400 is at, so 2400 kilometers away from the epicenter. Notice that if the, the seismic station was 2400 kilometers away from the epicenter, that the P wave would arrive just under five minutes after the earthquake started, and the S wave would arrive something like nine minutes after the earthquake started. Okay, and notice that there's an increasing distance between them because they're traveling at different speeds. So I always find it easier because there are so many squares on this graph 
to draw lines across. So the horizontal lines going across representing the 1400, the 1600, the 1800, and so on. And to draw vertical lines representing each one of the minutes, one minute, two minute, three minutes, and so on. That way you're shrinking down the boxes that you have to look at. Back in the late 70s and early 80s when I was involved in the punk scene and in bands back then, I actually went to a thrift store. I mean, that was where we shopped for all of our clothes back then. You know, that was kind of the cool thing to do if you're in the punk scene. And I went to a thrift store and I had a shirt that looked something like this graph. It was all these tiny little squares, but they were alternating black and white. And so when you looked at the shirt, it was like the shirt was moving. It kind of made you dizzy. A strange thing about that was that was actually a women's or woman's top. And I didn't know this until I started buying clothes in thrift stores. And we just back then, you know, it was sort of gender neutral. We just bought things that looked cool, basically. And I didn't realize that women's blouses actually had the buttons on the opposite side from men. So I lived my entire life buttoning one way. And then I had to button, you know, whenever I bought something that was a, a female blouse that looked sort of gender neutral, basically, I had to button on the other side. There you go. It's a little sidelight for you. A snippet, if you'll have it that way. All right. Now let's put on the P wave and the S wave again. Okay. So I'm pointing at with that kind of silver arrow, the vertical lines. What I want you to see is this between zero and one, and for that matter, between one and two and two and three and so on, there are 10 of these vertical lines, 10. That means what we have to do is divide a minute into tenths of minutes, okay? That's what we have to do. So what is one tenth of a minute? Well, 60 divided by 10 equals six. 60 seconds divided by 10 is six. So one tenth of a minute is six seconds. If we knew the S wave arrived three minutes and 24 seconds after the P wave, what we would do to convert that to tenths of minutes, we would keep the three minutes because you saw that there's these vertical lines. So that was gonna represent three, that's fine. But we need to convert that 24 seconds into tenths of a minute. And what we would do would be divide 24 by six, which is one tenth of a minute. And 24 divided by six is four. So the answer is that the S wave would have arrived 3.4 minutes after the P wave. You have to be able to do this to be able to complete the lab today at least successfully. So now look, I put two similar silver arrows on there. One is pointing at zero on the left-hand bottom side, and then the other is pointing at 3.4. That's the line for 3.4. What you do to determine how far away the epicenter is, if the S wave arrives 3.4 minutes after the P wave at your seismic station is this. You draw a line along the bottom from zero over to 3.4. That represents 3.4 minutes. So the length of that silver line is 3.4 minutes. Then you take that line and you bring it up along the top of the graph. And you have the left-hand side, the left-hand corner of that silver line touching the P wave. Then you can see that there's a blue arrow there. And what's going to happen is that silver line is slowly going to slide down the graph with the left-hand side constantly touching the P wave. Eventually, the right-hand side will be touching the S wave. You want to keep that line though, that silver line, parallel to the distance in kilometers, horizontal lines. Let's see what happens. So we begin to slide it down. You can see that the line on the left-hand side stays on the P wave, continuing to slide until right there. At this point, notice, that line is now touching both the P wave and the S wave, and we now have our distance from the epicenter. If you just draw that line straight across to the left-hand side, you can see that the epicenter, if the S wave arrives 3.4 minutes after the P wave at a seismic station, is 1,820 kilometers away. So how far is the epicenter? From the seismic station, if the S wave arrives 3.4 minutes after the P wave, the answer is 1,820 kilometers. Excellent.